All right, let us welcome back Jordan Levitt to the program. He returns to the Octagon at the UFC's next event on June 5th. He's going to take on Claudio Playas. Always a pleasure to have the Monkey King join us. Jordan, how are you, man? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing great. Of course, we're going to talk all about the fight, but right off the bat, the uh, the Monkey King and the Monkey Queen have been joined by the Monkey Princess. Back in January, you and your wife welcomed a baby daughter into the world, so congratulations officially now that I see you. How has uh, fatherhood been treating you thus far? Well, it's been treating me pretty dang good. I enjoy it. A little person growing more complex like exponentially and smiles when she sees me. It's pretty nice. Yeah, we kind of, I remember our last conversation, we spoke about what it would mean to you to be a dad. And, you know, she hadn't arrived yet. She was about to. She was kind of knocking on the door. And, you know, you felt like a lot of that weight and pressure was lifted off your shoulders because of getting that win over Matt Wyman, got the bonus and such. It took a lot of pressure from the finances off of you. But being a parent puts you in this, like, tunnel vision state where it's not just about fighting it's like everything else it almost like forces you to do better at everything because you know now you're the role model you're the example and and your dad right now like are you feeling it in that way as well because i mean being a dad myself i know it really does change you doesn't it yeah it changes me in the, especially in the sense that there's more of a sense of urgency about the things that i do and more of a sense of purpose like it's much easier to take care of just you and your wife than it is to take care of you and your wife and the person that you're trying to grow into like a contributing human being in society and be a good example. So it definitely has brought a sense of urgency and I'm not a person that ever feels a sense of urgency. I'm very flow, like, oh, it'll happen when things happen. But now I'm like trying to make things happen so I can you know, be the dad that she deserves and do the things I, I'm supposed to do. So it definitely is, you know, yeah, like I said, tunnel vision, more of like a focusing focusing influence on my life. What's been kind of the breakout moment thus far, like that breakout discovery? Because when kids, like, like for example, like when kids see bubbles for the first time, it's like seeing a unicorn. So have there been like, I know she's super young, but has there been like any exciting things your daughter has like discovered in this new and exciting world? Well, I learned that only I can make her laugh. And when I laugh, like, she'll laugh back. And it's kind of cool. We, like, share that little moment where like, I'm laughing at her laughing and she's laughing at me laughing. And it's, like, a really, you know, it's, like, a silly thing. It's also kind of, like, a beautiful thing because I was, like, especially of the belief, like, all my siblings, like, my older sister's five years apart. My younger sister's five years below me. So I don't really have a lot of memories of, like, a baby being around. So I kind of just took for granted. Oh, they're kind of like, their babies aren't very smart. You know, they're kind of like, like a house plant until they're like one or two. And then they become a person. But she's a person much faster than I anticipated and, you know, love her to death. And it's just really cool to see, like, even though, like, babies are very, you know, simple and emotional and stuff. It's really cool to see that like I could bring her joy. And that she can bring me joy. And we're kind of like, you know, it's like, even though a relationship's just starting, it's kind of really deep. And it's kind of a beautiful thing. You're kindred spirits right away. Mm -hmm. I know you were, you're obviously on Cloud9 now being a dad, but you were on Cloud9 after the win over Matt Wyman. And, you know, that was your first knockout win with that slam. And you were basically open to two options. It was either, you know, be there for your wife for the last stages of the pregnancy fight sometime like in the first half of 2021 or you were hoping to maybe bounce back and get on that December 19th card. So I'm curious, I'm wondering if anything was actually brought to your attention for a quick turnaround after the Wyman fight. There were a few last minute things for, for me to fill in the week of, and it didn't, you know, it didn't materialize, which is fair. 2020, I, I was super blessed. I had plenty of fights and a lot of fighters. They were just kind of stranded for a year. So you know, they gave the UFC made the, the better decision and like giving more people a shot to provide for themselves. I really wanted to get on that card. And then they told me to be ready for March. So I've been skinny since March and I haven't been this skinny for a fight ever. So if I lose, it's because I'm undersized and the UFC screwed me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So, I mean, listen, now you got that extra time with, with the fam, which is always great. And now we have a date, we have an opponent, Claudio Poyas, and this is going to be his fourth UFC walk. More of a grappling heavy style, kind of like yourself. And, and like the more I think about this fight, the more I feel like there's a lot of similarities between the two of you guys. Do you do you agree with that? 
Yeah, I agree. So I was saying in a previous interview, he's like, do you think this fight can be exciting? I'm like, honestly, it could probably be very awkward. Like, there's a pretty good chance this fight's going to be an ugly, strange, off-rhythm decision. But I hopefully I'll finish him. I'm, I'm trying to finish him for you guys. But, yeah, when this fight was given to me, I was like, that that's this could either be really good or really, really drum sluggish. He, uh... He's more of, um, he's a reactionary. Like, he walks forward, he gets scared and flustered, then he takes people down, and which I would do the same thing if people ever pressure me. They just don't yet. And I'm a person who presses forward and then takes them down. So I feel like this fight will be decided on who's more comfortable on the feet and who's more comfortable being patient. And I feel like I, I love pressure. I love scrambles. I love when things get going. I feel like he shies away from it. And we're both young, so even though he hasn't fought in OB like a year and a half on fight night, like I remember how much I improved from 22 to 24, and I imagine he'll improve just as much. So if I fight Claudio Poyes from 2018 to 2019, I think I, I think it should be there's very clear there's several clear paths to victory for me, but I'm really hoping I, I want this to be a hard fight. I haven't had a hard pro fight yet, and I kind of got into this to grow as a fighter and i'm out here looking for a loss not so much as looking for wins so i really hope that he's game i would really appreciate it if he was game <laughs> we haven't we haven't really seen a lot of you on the feet especially in your last couple of fights like with the with the striking a whole lot so i mean you're a guy who loves challenges and i feel like this could present an interesting challenge because you said it would be kind of awkward you know some of that wrestling and the grappling sort of negates itself and you guys would just stand there on the feet but you know, do you feel like you're, we're going to see a little bit more of that game that you have in this fight? Like, are we going to see, you know, Jordan Levitt throwing them bombs on June oh, 5th? I'm, I'm planning on it. <laughs> I know I have the power advantage. I know it. I know I'm not scared of getting hit. I, I just, I just, even though I have no reason to believe so from past experiences, I have no evidence in my favor. I just, I don't think he can hurt me, and I think I can hurt him on the feet. And I don't think I'm going to shoot first. Uh, I have dreams about the fight. And every time it plays out, I'm not panic shooting. I think he's going to panic shoot. I think they accepted this fight. They're okay. The grappling's going to cancel each other out, which it won't because I'm a better grappler. But if it does, I think they're going to be on the they're going to be on in, be on the stool after the second round and be like, "You need to knock this guy out. We don't know what's happening." And that's the plan. Pressure, confusion. Um, pressure makes diamonds or dust, and most people don't turn to diamonds. So we'll see what happens. Well said. Oh, yeah. I saw you've been um, getting in some work with Neil Melanson. That guy is one of the more underrated gems from a coaching perspective in the sport. And you haven't seen like a whole lot of him around, like at least in the public eye over the last few years. And he's obviously cornered a lot of big names, helped him get to, to the next level, to world titles, et cetera. Like, how much of an eye opener has it been adding Neil to the mix? It's been, I've never been humbled with grappling. I've always kind of been a savant for grappling. Like, it came to me very naturally. But when I train with Neil, he'll explain things like in 12 words. And I'll be like, I feel so stupid for not coming to the same conclusion. And, you know, and he's a big guy, but, you know, he's also has bed shits, he's blind, you know, has, a has basically one functional arm because he has a torn tricep. And we'll roll. And he'll murder me. Like, there is not a thing I can do. And I'm learning so many, like, mean tricks, which my style is very flowy, not a lot of, like, brutalness in what I do. And he's basically, he's, he's taking it to the next level a little bit. My style is going to be a little bit more sadistic, especially if I get to do some Neil Melanson stuff. And I'm very blessed to finally get to work out with him, like, regularly, regularly, um, two to three times a week. Because I, you know... I remember buying his triangle book when it first came out when I was in high school. And I remember buying his instructionals and it's just wild to have him, you know, on my side now, sadly, he can't corner me, but hopefully for the next fight, he'll be able to make it. Why not? Um, just quarantines and health issues. You know, he doesn't want to commit if he can't be sure if he can make it. And I would totally understand. Um, you know, like a bad shit is like Crohn's disease, like on steroids. And I would hate for him to feel pressured and not feel well and stuff. Yeah. Especially when we're quarantined for several days. It's kind of is a recipe 
or disaster, I imagine. So hopefully next fight, we'll get to see some Neil Melanson in my corner. Well, you get to bring some of that Neil with you into this fight. And, you know, I was I was actually wondering about this because a lot of times when you come off of a finish like you had, like a big time memorable debut, there's like an added pressure that comes along to try and top it. Like I know Joaquin Buckley after that insane spin kick knockout of Impa Kasangadai, he had last year, like he admitted that he felt extra pressure to try to live up to or even top that moment, which is like almost impossible to do. Something tells me not a lot weighs on your shoulders. Like you said, you're very flow. And now you got Neil Melanson teaching you all these sadistic things. But do you feel like in a way you, you've had to battle with that in the back of your mind at all? So to be honest, I still mostly see my last knockout victory as more of a lucky happening. I never trained for that. And it was like in the moment, I'm like, oh, yeah. And then for my forearm here and I slam and I could get an, and then it happened. So it'd be different if like I trained those things. And then that was like a that was like a tool I knew was in the I knew was in my toolbox. But since it's it's not really characteristic of my style, I kind of I don't plan on it probably ever doing that again. So for me, since it was like a happy accident, I don't feel any pressure. I am. I mean, I mean. It's the fastest debut in my division history. It's a slam knockout. All these cool things. But, like, it's just a fist fight at the end of the day. I don't see why so many guys make it so much crazier, more important than it is. If this guy would have pushed me on the playground, I would have pushed him back. We would have fought. And we just get paid to do it. So, a win's a win. If I could top last time, that'd be wonderful. But you can't really top that highlight. So I'm just going to go out there, no expectations, except to show more of my skills, hopefully. A little bit more time, a little bit more ring time. I'm going to get ring rust of all these first round finishes. So, yeah. How does, like, how, how does that Zen state stick with you like as a fighter? Because not like you said, not a lot of people think that way. They just, you know, it's it's everything. Fighting is everything to them. And, you know, while it's a big part of your life, you're not, you know, putting all that extra weight of of the fight game and, you know, and taking all that with you everywhere you go, you just, this is what I do and it's cool and I like it and it's fun. Like, where does that come from? Like, have you always been like that? Towards the end of high, like I used to be a very anxious, very shy person and I didn't do well with like social things and I wasn't very popular and I was horrible at first impressions and, you know, bad at dating and blah, all the things that nerd little nerdy, weird, you know, fruity kids from Las Vegas suffer from. So my senior year, I kind of like had like an epiphany where I was like, I got to be happy with myself. and I got to be comfortable like with who I am. And, and if people aren't comfortable with that, it doesn't matter. Like you can't win everybody. And I kind of just kind of gained the courage to be disliked by other people. And once I stopped, you know, worrying about how people perceive me, it allowed me to really come out of my shell. And I really feel like a lot of people put on like a facade, especially in the fight game. They have this alter ego. They try to show the world and it's not really who they are. And I can't imagine like wearing like a mask again, going back in my shell. It's, you know, I'd rather live this life, like working this career, being who I am, than leaving this sport and being like, oh yeah, this is who I was trying to find myself again. I've already found myself. And I like who I see. I like who I see in the mirror. I like to fight. And I just, it's just a fight. At the end of the day, like, I prefer to win. And I prefer to get the win bonus. And, you know, everything is better when you win. But I'm mostly just fine because I love it. And all the other benefits are just, you know, um, accessory. That is so cool, man. Like that's a, that's gotta be such a freeing feeling. Like outside of having a screaming baby in the house, you must sleep tremendously on a, on a nightly basis, not having to deal with that anxiety that a lot of other people deal with. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I always joke with like my wife and my friends, I'm like anxieties for people who need to create problems for themselves because I was raised by my mom. My mom's like been the, my, been the rock of like my life. You know, she raises like three kids on her own um risk it all to start a business and she did a really good job and she didn't start having anxiety until we all kind of grew up and now she like has less worries you know i feel like a lot of times when 
you have a struggle and you have hardships in your life, you get addicted to those things and a lot of, you know, create problems for them to overcome. But, you know, life's already hard, even with a positive attitude, even when like it's lovely and everything goes according to plan. Life's still, life's still a lot life. Crap happens. But I ain't gonna, I'm not going to create any more problems for myself than, you know, what God's have put in my path. And, you know, perhaps I'm not as intense as I could be. Perhaps I could be better if I was more competitive, more driven. And I kind of like gave into that ego. But honestly, I'm just like so blessed to be at where I am in my life at this age with like my health intact and my mental, my mental faculties, you know, unaffected. You know, my life's in God's hands and I'm aware of that. And I'm just really going to be thankful for any blessings I'm blessed with. Because so I'm, a lot of the times, I'm not sure if I'm like worthy of all the great things that's happened for me. That's, uh, yeah, that's something that a lot of people have to deal with and weigh in the back of their minds. But you don't want to create problem, problems for yourself. But on June 5th, you plan on creating problems for one Claudio Pueyes. How do we get this done? Do we have, do we have an official Jordan Levitt prediction here? I'm going to pressure him. He's going to shoot and I'm going to submit him and punish him for his insolence. <laughs> and that's <what's> going on. <laughs> you can see like the effect Rose, uh, Roxanne Montefiore has on you. Cause that's like very similar to how she predicts fights. Yeah. She's my hero. You know, Roxy's really been a big influence. Um, you know, helped me gain that courage to be disliked, so to speak. You know, it's very hard. She's like an anime protagonist, you know, happy go lucky. She changes the people around her for the better. And, you know, she, she changed my life and my career for the better. And it's given me a lot of courage to be who I am. And it's worked out great. So, you know, thankful, to her, thankful for her all the time. How's she doing? She's doing good. Walking better every day after her knee surgery. And, you know, and she just seems very happy and sad. And I'm excited for her to get back out there and to do what she does best. As uh, are a lot of people watching this right now. So just to sort of keep in w with tradition, Jordan, we'll, we'll wrap the chat up by checking in on the Jordan Levitt book suggestion for all the peeps out there. I know you like to challenge yourself on a yearly basis to read a, a certain number of books. Uh, have you set a number for yourself this year? I know life has changed a little bit in 2021, but uh, if so, is there something new and exciting you read that you've read recently that you would recommend to the folks watching and listening right now? So I, my goal is for between 50 and 60 books this year. I'm trying not to do too crazy a number, 75 to 100. It's really stressful. But if I had to recommend one book, book series that I've really enjoyed this year, they're Murderbot Diaries and stuff. They're a novella series, um, nice little sci-fi. Each, like maybe there are like six of them, all three hour long reads. They're really good. I'm not a big fan of sci-fi, but it's kind of, cool following like a robot who's like learning how to be an individual so yeah the murder pro the murder bot series by for sure i definitely recommend that highly there you go jordan levitt's recommendation and he never steers you wrong just ask our own jose young's big fan of jordan levitt's suggestions and uh i'm sure if jordan suggested jose will, will suggest it as well so jordan always great catching up with you man congratulations on everything really appreciate the time and uh all the best to you for the rest of this build and then the fight itself on june 5th man all right. Thank you, Mike. You have a good one. I look forward to talking to you next time.